It's a pleasure this afternoon to have Professor Kaveta Bala from Cornell University, where she's an associate professor in the CS department. She received her SM and PhD from MIT and her BTEC from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. Professor Bala co-authored the graduate textbook, Advanced Global Illumination, and I think we're going to hear some stuff related to that topic today. She's co-chaired the Eurographic Symposium on Rendering and the Pacific Graphics Conference. She's received an NSF Career Award, Cornell's College of Engineering James and Mary Keene Excellence in Teaching Award, which she's received twice, and the Affinito Stewart Award. Please welcome Professor Bala. Hi, can you hear me? Is this mic on? Great. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for the introduction. Um, the title of my talk today is, When is a Rendered Image Good Enough? And sort of the subtitle, there are many, you know, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? That's one of the sub subtitles. And it's also perceptually based realistic rendering, which is sort of the application domain. Uh, to give credit where credit is due, uh, these are all the collaborators I've worked with. Uh, the top two lines are my students, uh, PhD students, and uh, the bottom are you know, senior collaborators, Fabio Pellaccini, who's actually a professor here in computer science, who someday I've collaborated with. So, hi, Fabio. Um, but what I'm going to do today is talk about the work by Ganesh and Jim and Bruce, are the primary movers and shakers, so I'll give them credit for this work. All right, so uh, first let's just step back and talk about what the motivation of the research that uh, I do and a large bunch of people in my community do. So the real world is very complex, and uh, the appearance of the real world is very complex. And our goal, and I work in the area of rendering, is to capture this complexity and produce images that look like the real thing. Okay. And these are all examples. Uh, you know, you can see this leaf, and uh, it's got a lot of you know shine and texture to it. And there's a whole forest full of leaves interacting with each other. And that gives you some sense of the complexity of the kinds of scenes that we deal with in graphics. Uh, there's jellyfish, lights scatter in them. I like them particularly. I just like jellyfish. And they're scattering in this sort of uh, stone um, and this uh, object here being held in that hand. Uh, that's sort of uh, natural images. There's also man-made materials and scenes that we want to produce images of. So that's, uh, there are images of Grand Central Station there, the Bilbao Museum. Um, and one is a, a model of a car, and the other is a model of a kitchen. And these are all the kinds of man-made materials and scenes that we would like to produce images of. OK. So what are the areas that care about this domain uh, and this problem domain of rendering and producing images of very high quality? Uh, so I'll mention a few. Uh, there are many. Cultural heritage is one. This is a reconstruction of uh, uh, the Kalab Shah temple in Egypt that actually the model was made in the University of Bristol. Uh, using it for simulation, this is a, a Mars rover simulation that is done ahead of time because you want to land these vehicles safely and see that you know everything looks good. Uh, two major applications are uh, industrial design and architectural design. So in industrial design, I just showed an example here of uh, the Boeing Dreamliner, um, but you know that's just one example. Every man-made object, tables, chairs, nowadays everything is done on a computer. When you're designing it, you want to visualize how it looks so that you can be effective at your design. And then there's sort of the more popularly well-known applications of this kind of research, which is the entertainment industry. And you know there's movies and games. And I just tossed up some examples. They aren't necessarily the best ones. Uh, but the argument, and even in movies, I'd like to sort of point out, there are sort of two types of movies that are shown there. There's, um, and I don't know, it's kind of dark. I hope you can see all these images. Um, there's a sort of very stylized rendering that happens in movies, like that's from Kung Fu Panda. And then if you've seen Avatar, that has a more, you're supposed to suspend disbelief and be immersed there, and it's supposed to seem more realistic. So there's two different types of realism, even in the movie industry. And that's one big area of, of uh, uh, one big application domain of rendering. There's another application domain, which I'm actually going to focus on more, which is sort of this e-commerce application. So this was uh, taken from um, some of our collaborators at Autodesk who are looking, who we are working with on their rendering software. And the problem here is, what if we create a world where you can go online and actually and you know, design your whole house, your whole kitchen, with thousands or tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment, refrigerators, uh, countertops, et cetera, click a button and buy it, 
all online and actually believe you're going to get something that looks like what, you're, what actually shows up at your door, right? So there's, that's the kind of realism that we want to achieve, where you're making big economic decisions for yourself on, on the basis of the quality of the image that you're getting out. And there's other applications. I won't get into all of them. Scientific visualization, telecollaboration, uh, training is a big one where you know, things have to look like the real thing. And what I'm going to just briefly talk about, though, just because the audience uh, is broad, is uh, there's this uh, different applications actually do have very different goals when we talk about realism. So as I said, the, the entertainment industry kind of is focused more on plausible imagery, imagery that looks like it might be real. And it, you know, they're focused on sort of the suspension of disbelief. Whereas the application domain I'm going to argue for as being the one that, you know, the, the area where my algorithms actually plug in better, perhaps, are the areas where you actually do care. It's not plausible, it's not good enough. It actually needs to be predictive and look like the real thing. And it needs to be accurate. Having said that, the kinds of scalable algorithms that we come up with are applied to the complexity of all of these application domains. So they work, work in both areas. Um, I'm going to also just say, feel free to chime up and you know, ask questions or something as we're going along. Because if you miss sort of the, the setup of the problems as we go along, then you won't get as much from the rest of the talk. So just feel free to ask questions if you need to. OK, so what is the problem we're trying to solve? So the rendering problem is really, um, it's we want to produce an image. And as I said, when you produce an image, you're basically figuring out some measure of the energy that's coming to your eye through every pixel in the image. Okay. And what's your input? So you have an algorithm that does this. What does it take as input? It spits out an image at the end. It takes as input some description of the scene representation, the scene geometry, the shapes of the objects. Typically, these are represented by lots of tiny triangles, um, particularly for complex models. Okay? You, it, it, I'm not sure you can see this at all. You can? Yeah. And so, yeah, if you can. OK, well, can we try that, though? I'm a little worried that uh, you're going to miss. That will help. I think that'll help more because, yeah, that that. I, I would go dark. Can we kill one of those lights? No, I. <laughs> He's not. Okay. Well, if you can just make it as dark as possible, because it's uh, there's a lot of images, and if you can't see it, it's going to be tough. And I'm going to ask you to, oh, all right. So you can see the images. At some point, I'll ask for audience part participation. I don't know how I'll pull that off. <laughs> so we'll worry about that when we get there. Right now, let's just describe the problem. So you have some specification of the geometry of the objects, the shape of objects. You have some specification of the material properties. How does light interact with that object? And uh, the lighting that's coming in. And there's a strange cross that I've used to represent the lighting. In this case, there are two light sources in the scene. Uh, I'll explain that cross later. Just believe that you know, there are, these are the three inputs to your algorithm. The algorithm munches together and produces the output image. How does it munch it all together? Well, let's talk about the kinds of things you see in the real world and maybe you don't think about because you don't do graphics or you don't worry about these things. So here's a, and by the way, this is a Cornell box, which is very famous in, our, in my community. Uh, here's a, an image of a bunch of things, a teapot, some funny floating uh, spheres, and a cylinder. And the thing to note is that it shows certain lighting properties. So there are soft shadows down here. These arise because light uh, is blocked by this object. But uh, you know, there's an area light here, and so it casts a soft shadow. There are shiny, glossy reflections on here. That's the term that's used, glossy reflections. There's refractions, which everybody's familiar with. And there's a phrase that we uh, call color bleeding, which is really that this part of the, the ceiling is a little green. And the reason is because light is reflecting around in the scene, and it's hitting the green wall and then getting to the ceiling. And this is actually uh, one of the hardest problems, uh, and it's been a holy grail of computer graphics for a long time, is how do you compute all of this indirect illumination, light bouncing around and reaching some equilibrium condition? So what an algorithm would do, a rendering algorithm is, is there's an eye and there's an image plane. And you're trying to figure out what's, in the, what's the color you put for each image, for each pixel in the image. So the way it's done is, and I'm going to talk about a particular algorithm called ray tracing. You shoot a ray through the pixel. You figure out what object is visible in the scene at that, through that pixel. What can I see there? And then I need to figure out what color to give it 
To figure that part, you simulate the physics of light interacting with materials, and you basically trace light either forward from the light sources to that point or backward. But either way, you consider all possible paths that the light can take uh, going from the light source interacting with the whole environment and arriving at that pixel. Okay? And the typical algorithm that you use is Monte Carlo sampling of some sort. And it's accurate, but it's incredibly slow. It could take hours uh, or at least many minutes for, you know, with parallel processing, all of that stuff, many minutes for a scene like this, and hours for very complex scenes, months on clusters for some very, very complex scenes. OK. So what makes it hard is that the light has to interact. So the two types of interactions I'll just uh, focus on is light has to interact with all the materials. Uh, if there are mirrors in the scene, that's OK. You can just figure out what the reflected direction is and go from there and simulate the physics. This is all physics 101. But uh, when you hit a surface and the light scatters all over the scene, that's actually when it gets hard. And these are sort of diffuse surfaces or Lambertian surfaces. And uh, more, the real world basically has these glossy surfaces. They're neither so specialized as to be uh, mi mirrors or diffuse. And that's where the challenge comes in. Light scatters in some complex pattern, and you have to simulate all of that scattering. The other reason uh, these uh, algorithms are very expensive is because they interact with the medium. When I assume that there was clear air, you, there's no interaction with the medium. But if you have fog, if you have light entering glass-like objects, and these two were rendered actually using our algorithms, if you have materials like jade, uh, then light enters the medium, it interacts with the medium, and then escapes. Uh, it's called subsurface scattering in that case volumetric scattering in, when it's in air or water. And that makes the computation very expensive. Okay, So is it all, does everybody understand sort of why this is a, a very hard problem? Further, uh, there's uh, more stresses that are coming to bear on such systems. For example, scene complexity keeps growing. Here's an example from the digital Michelangelo project, where the Michelangelo were scanned in using laser range scanners. And I'm just zoomed into the eye. If you can see, oh, you can't see much. But OK, this little white stuff, each one of them is a tiny, tiny triangle. OK? So there are millions and millions of polygons that are used to represent a scene like this. Uh, there are databases of materials. You can see that there are different types of balls of different uh, material properties that people have been acquiring. And there's complex illumination that comes together that has to be simulated. Uh, the physics of it has to be simulated. OK. So now I'm going, to, I'm going to paint with broad strokes and tell you sort of where the world is and where we'd like to be. So if you look at sort of this, the world in the very, very simplified uh, two axes, time is on the x-axis, complexity and realism are on the y-axis. Reality, of course, sits on the top of the y-axis because it's real time and it's very real. Right? That's the nature of reality. And what we want to do is get there. So how do we get there? Uh, I would argue algorithms that have put all kinds of squigglies here to show that there's, these aren't real axes. But you know, high quality rendering algorithms sit there. That capsule has a certain uh, shape. The point is, as your scene gets more complex, the algorithm slows down proportionally. And you may say, that makes total sense. You put more stuff inside in your inputs, you got slower algorithms. But what we really want to do, oops is uh, go to algorithms that look more like that blue capsule. And what's different about that blue capsule, apart from the fact that it's very close to reality, is that it actually has this nature where as you increase complexity, yeah, you might pay a little penalty in time, but you're not going to slow down horribly. And why would I believe that that is possible? One is that we, we have to develop scalable algorithms that make that happen. So it's possible because we're going to make it happen. But the, the real reason is because there are limitations to what human beings can perceive. And that's really the one that we, we need to exploit to achieve the scalability. So it's scalability with respect to complexity of the scenes that you're sending in. Okay? And the, the kinds of limitations I'm talking uh, well, I'll explain that more, clear, uh, more later. But essentially, we want to use these insights that human beings are not as good as we think we are at, at uh, understanding scenes and understanding images. Can we encode that and exploit that to do better for very complex rendering? OK. So what are the kind of uh, things you can do? So here is this uh, rendering of that temple again. And to scale to it, I'd like to say, let me just draw attention to one thing. So this is a, a, a pretty nice rendering of it. Now let's zoom in on the pillar. If you zoom in on the pillar, you can see there's tons of detail there. There's these undulations of the surface, there's fine shadows that are in there because of the undulations of the surface and the scrolls, et cetera. But if you go back to the original image, and let me see if I can. Ooh, I think I can. 
All right. If you go back to the original image, you can't see that detail. All right. So there's a very obvious idea that you want to use. If you don't see it, don't compute it. Okay. And that makes total sense. I can't see the detail. There's just tons of, you know, you can get right down to electrons when you're simulating uh, or, you know, at the light level. But of course, it doesn't make sense to simulate at that level. So if you don't see the detail, don't compute it. This has been sort of something that people understand in graphics for a while. But the next step is sort of another interesting, a more interesting paradox that arises. Um, I, you might have heard the phrase, less is more, by Mies van der Rohe. And I say the opposite. I say more is less. And here's what I mean by that. Here's that same scene, but now we've added a foggy day, and there's motion blur because I'm walking through with a camera that has a certain aperture time, and I produce an image like this of that temple. And one of the first things you might notice is, remember that region we were looking at? You can barely see any detail in it at all. Okay, So in fact, there's this paradox here where I've added a lot more complexity. The, you know, When I want to uh, simulate the fog, simulate all the detailed interactions of light with these media, I could slow down my algorithm quite a bit. But actually, I'm getting less in my image. So my final image is less, has less visual salience in all of those features. So I sure would like to be able to exploit that paradox and do less work here instead of doing more work. Okay, So that's one example of, uh, of the insights we'd like to exploit. The other is another limit of human perception. So I won't talk about this work in much detail, but I'll just tell you about uh, briefly about one project we ran. We showed people images like this, and we told them, and this is because it is true, these are images of two potted plants. They're two different types of potted plants. They have flowers of different colors. Uh, are these equivalent aggregates? Okay, And what do we mean by that? We wanted somebody to look at it and tell us, you know, are these aggregates about the same in terms of their distribution. And sure enough, people would look at this and they'd say, it's got lots of you know, potted plant A and B. They're randomly arranged. They seem to have an even distribution. Yeah, these are equivalent aggregates. Does everybody, do most people agree with that? And now this is the audience participation part. Raise your hands if you agree with it. You've got to do something. I won't move on. OK. Um, and it turns out, and I'm sure the ones who didn't raise it, well, so we ran a study, and yes, people do agree with that. It turns out that, in fact, that's not the case. Uh, we have a 50-50 distribution of the two potted plants on one side and 70-30. And they're just not good. And I don't, you know, when I look at these images, it's not like I, because I spend a lot of time with them, know them better. We're not good at judging these kinds of ratios and stuff like that as human beings. And so this is an example of how there's very high complexity in these scenes, but there's a limit to what we as human beings can get out of it. And therefore, can we exploit that in the context, say in this case, in computer modeling, to try to pick the combination that's actually cheaper, has fewer polygons to represent them, or, or is cheaper for the memory it uses, and use that to achieve efficiency. OK? All right. So this is another example of that paradox, more is less. OK. So in today's talk, I'm basically going to talk about uh, two questions. One is this perception issue. When is an image good enough? And there's a sort of sub-questions that you ask. Is it indistinguishable from reality, from a reference rendering? Is that what we're aiming for? And I'll actually argue not. Is good enough for what? That'll be more clear as we go. And I'll introduce sort of a new metric uh, that tries to capture scene appearance that's trying to address these questions. And once you have some sense of the perception of these images, the question is, can I apply it to produce scalable rendering algorithms? Um, and the particular algorithm I'll talk about is light cuts, which is one of the algorithms uh, we've developed to try to look at scalable rendering. And the question is, to do that, I need to be able to reason about the error I'm introducing and couple that with our knowledge of human perception. And that's one of the hard parts, is coupling those two together, because both sides need to talk in the other side's language. OK. So in current uh, Im image for the quality standards and graphics, um, you'd look at these two images. And let me just go back. And if I asked you, are these two images the same? And because this projector is this dark, I don't know if you'll see the difference. There are differences. Uh, so do you think the image is the same? They're actually different. And I'll show you where the differences are. You can particularly notice them. They're on the curved part of the dragon body and, and other places. And there are algorithms that can detect that. And they will light up red where there are visible differences. Okay. I'll go back and ask you the, uh, a question. So these are clearly different images. Do you care? Right? <laughs> and that's sort of what we're trying to do. We're trying to come up with an image quality standard that captures what we actually care about. Sure, they're different, but I'm not so sure they're important differences. So let's talk a little about that. So what, what are images? Right? As I said, it's this combination of geometry, material, and lighting. 
But what do they actually do for us? So when, I, when we look at images, we're trying to actually get a sense of the scene appearance. We're not just looking at them you know, because the pixels are exciting. It's because they're conveying to us a sense that here's this model of a dragon. It's a shiny, glossy, greenish uh, dragon. It's lit from the left. And, and that's sort of what you get. And that's what images do for us. Shape, material, lighting is the information they give us. And unfortunately, what these algorithms that are out there that are reasoning about pixels tell us is how good are the pixels compared to some reference? What's the L2 norm? Or if, even if you go beyond the L2 norm and use some notion of human perception, it's still talking at a pixel level. Okay? And so this, you, know, you see that that dragon is lit up in this red in places where it's different. But as I said, it, there's this fundamental disconnect between how we understand images and how we measure image quality. And they're trying to bridge the gap between them by introducing this idea of, of visual equivalence which is that we would say, in this case, these two dragons really, they give us the same information that we want about shape, material, and lighting. And so they're visually equivalent. Um, and that's just for you to know. That happens to be the reference rendering. I actually never can remember which one is the right one. So that's for my reference, too. OK, so an image is good enough. Images are visually equivalent to each other if they convey the same scene appearance, shape, material, and lighting. Okay? As an, as an aside, let me give you an example of images that are not perhaps equivalent. Do you think that these two images are, you know, they're good enough? They, one, any one of them could replace the other? Or do you think one of them conveys more information to you about the, about the scene? And which one do you think it is? The right one? Your right. Raise your hand if you think it's your right. OK, and raise your hand if you think it's your left. OK. So let me just tell you the difference between these two. Um, one of them is without the scattering of light, and one is with. And these are look more stark than uh, it should be. But these are actually glass, uh, little tiles of glass. And if they're little tiles of glass, that doesn't look glassy. That looks more plasticky. Whereas this one captures how light interacts with the material. And so in this case, uh, it, the one on the left, the one that I claim was more plasticky, was just ignoring the effect of in refraction, whereas the one on the right was actually capturing the fact that light refracts. And in fact, because it refracts, you can get multiple paths of light, and you get things called volumetric caustics. And so if you put it together and he said, do you believe that one of them is glass, one of those images conveys that information to you better than the other. Right, so that's an example of, of equivalence that you know doesn't uh, inequivalence, if you will. So given this definition, uh, we are sort of trying to introduce sort of a, a notion of appearance-preserving standards of image fidelity, and the hope is really that we can design whole new graphics algorithms that don't compare with the reference. We com we compute a, an equivalent image that doesn't refer to the reference image. And the reason this is a good thing is if you're particularly thinking about algorithms where you're trying to speed up performance, if you have to compute the reference to compare against before you know that you're good enough, then you've already solved the problem. You haven't gained anything by doing all of this reasoning. And so our goal is to develop predictive rendering algorithms that don't need a reference, but will be guaranteed to capture the information you care about, which is the shape and the material and the lighting, et cetera, so that you can do the work you need to do with a rendering algorithm. OK. So um, I'm going to pause just for a second. Are there any questions about this part? I'm going to start talking about how we actually explore visual equivalence. Sorry. And uh, are there any questions? or? Hard to see. Whoops. And this also forces you to wake up if you were dozing off. OK, good. Um, great, thanks. Sorry for. <laughs> um, so we want, uh, as I said, we want to look at this, this new, new, uh, new measure of image quality. And so we're going to have a person looking at two images. And both of them happen to have the same geometry and material. So we're not messing with that in the, in the study I'll talk about now. We've done different studies. I don't have time to talk about all of them. But one of them is a reference illumination, and one of them is a transformed illumination. And if you remember, I told you I tried to explain these crosses to you. Now's the time I explain the crosses to you. So let's consider an object that's being lit by, uh, you know, light is coming onto the surface, and you can see, uh, in fact, the reflection of the world in that object. Okay, and so that's depicted on the t on the bottom is the image, on the top is sort of some notion of the light field that's coming on the surface. And the light is coming in, and that little conical thing was showing which, uh, because of the material is a little, uh, uh, it's not a pure mirror, it'll actually integrate some of the light coming in in that cone of directions on the surface to evaluate the surface. Okay. 
And this is typically, there are many ways that you could represent this. One way that is common in computer graphics, and the reason I'm introducing this is because we'll use this a lot, is to then consider a box around the object, consider the whole incoming light to be sort of squished onto the box, projected onto that box, and then you unwrap that box, and that becomes the total lighting. It's a little very handy tool to represent the lighting that's coming in on a surface, OK? It's this little cross. Is that clear? The transformation I applied here? OK, from now on, I'm going to only refer to lighting in the context of this cross that's lighting that uh, object. OK. So given that these are, this is the incoming light on some object, we wanted to understand how much can you mess with that lighting and get away with it. And people will not be able, uh, they might be able to tell the difference, and they won't care. Right? That's sort of the visual equivalence idea. It doesn't affect their perception of the appearance of the scene. So we considered two transformations on the lighting. One is we just blurred the lighting. So we continue to light this object, but we blurred the light that's coming towards it. And the other is that we warp the lighting. And there are five different blurs and five different warps. And why did we consider these? Turns out blurring is one of the common transformations that happens as a sort of a side effect of wavelet compression, uh, where you throw away certain coefficients. When you throw away those coefficients, you're basically throwing away high frequency parts of the signal. So it happens to be a very common thing that people do in, in, uh, in representing these kinds of lights. Warping was something that, when we were studying it, was not something people actually did. And it seemed kind of crazy. And in fact, when you look at the warp, by the way, by the time you get to warp four or five, that T and Z letters, which were quite clear in, in warp one, are really quite messed up, right? They're quite muddled. And so we studied these two by rendering a bunch of objects. And we want to study sort of the range of objects. Spheres are very simple, but they're perfect reflectors of their surround. In graphics and in the real world, you don't have spheres floating around. So you want to study a range of geometries. And I'll show these four geometries, and a range of materials. So this material is particularly shiny, the one at the bottom. And as you go to the top, it gets more and more uh, diffuse. And we wanted to understand the effect in these cases. So what, what we've done is we've taken these objects, we've slapped these funny, messed up lighting on them, we've rendered these images, and we've shown them to people. And the reason we wanted to do this is to understand when, is, when are these images equivalent and when are they not. So all transformations are not visually equivalent. Uh, for example, if I were to do something to the lighting so that the image, I produce the image on the right, and I told you, are these two equivalent, you would probably say no. Do you agree with that? Yes. yes. And the reason is because when you look at the one on the right, it's not, it doesn't seem as shiny. The material properties have changed. So if you were to go and buy this, uh, and you were looking for a very shiny ball for whatever reason, that's not the one you'd pick. You'd pick this one, right? Because this looks shinier. So this is not a equival uh, visually equivalent transformation. Uh, and sure enough, I had blurred the environment map in this case. But let's consider some that might be equivalent. So here's one example. Here are two images. It's a slightly bumpy object. It's not very bumpy, but it's not a, a pure ball. Um, and these are equivalent. Now, I've, I've, I'm stating that as a fact because we ran a user study that said that. But you can try to convince yourself. Can you tell which one of these was rendered with, um, you know, if you, can, if you can tell which one was rendered with the correct lighting and which one was not, raise your hand and take a guess. <laughs> I, I can't still tell them, by the way. And in fact, I had a, I, I convinced myself one of them was the right one, and it wasn't. Um, here's another example. These two images are actually different, and uh, they're not that different. This is a, oh, this is a funny caustic that's coming from, oh, it's my laptop. Yeah, OK. So they're not that different. Uh, if I take that part away, which uh, I'm producing, these two are, are, are a little different from each other, but they're equivalent. The top two are quite different, by the way. And the way to note that is to look at the specular highlight here and here. So they are quite a bit more different, and yet people can't tell which one is correct and which one is wrong. And I'll, and I'll show you which one is right and wrong. The one on the left is lit by reference, and the one on the right is lit with this extremely warped incoming light field. And we can't tell the difference. Okay. So we actually ran, so I have presented some of the results of our study, but we actually ran a whole study. We showed you know, users these scenes. We asked them to compare and notice see, these two images are different. So there are differences, particularly look at the specular highlight again. And But we asked, are the shapes the same, materials the same? Are they lit like some reference? And we are trying to capture this higher level idea of equality between these images. Not that they're pixel for pixel the same. They're not the same pixel by pixel, but they're giving us the same information of the scene as we wanted. And I'm going to just, there's a lot of data here, so I'm just going to quickly try to show you the trends. Uh, let's look at this graph. 
Um, here on in any one of these cubes, uh, sorry, squares, we have four different geometries, left to right, the sphere on the left, on your left too, yes, and the uh, uh, blobby on the right, and then the shiny uh, on the bottom and the, uh, and the uh, more diffuse on the top. And you'll see red is bad. They look different. It's not an acceptable transformation. Green, uh, this, this green, just plain green, means I couldn't even tell the difference between the images. The transformation was very subtle. And the green with the dot is the interesting new case we've come up with. There are differences, and I'm perfectly happy with either image. I just am not able to, to uh, you know, pick them correctly. And in fact, you fill this hole out for um, all the different warps and all the different blurs. The thing to note is that blurs, we don't do so well on. Blurring is not an acceptable transformation on lighting because it changes your sense of its material, uh, material properties. But warping, which is a little strange, is in fact acceptable. There's an awful lot of these uh, greens with dots in them. And so that was one of the results we had. And in fact, you know, to make it more useful, we actually developed a, a classifier that classifies this data so that given any arbitrary piece of geometry and material, uh, then this was you use support vector machines for this. You can toss it at this and figure out whether you're going to be equivalent or not. And we can even generalize it then to we ran our whole experiment of blobbies, but we could generalize it to uh, dragons, which are very common in graphics. And uh, uh, you've seen the movie. Um, and, and other you know, so illuminations and materials. And we correctly. So and I, the thing to note here is the visible difference of predictors lights up quite a bit. We predicted equivalence on the top, non-equivalence, inequivalence in the bottom. Uh, the bottom is actually very close. The VDP doesn't light up terribly much. This one lights up a lot more. But it turns out this is inequivalent. For some reason, you notice some small difference that, that makes you think one of them is a little duller than the other. And then we confirmed it with a separate user study. And in fact, we were right. Uh, this is not equivalent, and this was. So that validates our, our model and our predictor as well. So that was sort of the, the result of, of this whole uh, study on equivalence just with respect to illumination transformations. How might you use this in graphics? I'll give you sort of a, some proof of concept applications, particularly one of them, where we applied it in the context of wavelet compression. And, and what we looked at is, um, so you have your, say, your lighting that's there on the top. And if you apply it through a wavelet compression algorithm, you might land, if you keep only 100 coefficients, you might land up with this representation at the bottom here of the lighting. It's not a very good representation, uh, but it happens to be, you know, what people use commonly in, in the field. OK. So how would you use this warping idea to uh, help with this uh, approach? So here's what happens. It turns out if you take your wavelet representation, and it looks something like this. There's some feature in the middle of the wavelet. And if you apply a regular compression and decide to keep only five uh, coefficients, you might land up with a reconstructed signal that looks something like this. Of course, you've torn it, tossed some stuff out because you're only using five coefficients. But if you use warping and you mess with the lighting ahead of time based on the predictor that we had, so we said for a very shiny uh, geometry and for a very complex geometry, you can get away with a lot of equivalence. Say we happen to um, warp it based on that and move the light around a little bit and then compress it, you can arrive at a reconstruction that isn't the same as the original, but might capture more of the features of the original okay, and produce more equivalence. So to see this in, in action, here are these two, uh, as I said, the, uh, on the top of the compressed uh, representations of the lighting. And the original is there on the left. And the warped uh, and compressed version is on the right. And I don't know if you can see the differences, but actually, uh, they both use 50 wavelets. But this one captures a lot more of sort of the high frequency component than this one. And it turns out, and this is the original, and the, the warped one actually looks like the real thing, whereas this one doesn't. It's just too far from the original. Okay, So this is one example where you have used this idea of visual equivalence. Not in this case, well, you can argue whether it's performance or quality. They're really two sides of the same coin. But you've argued for an algorithm that does a better job of representing your scene and therefore letting you do your job by capturing the material properties of the scene. Okay. Are there any questions about this part? No. Oh. Good? OK, so that's the, yeah, go ahead. Is there some pattern to the warp? Is there a pattern to the warp? How, how do you know the warp is that? That's very good. OK, so that's a good point. How do you pick how much you warp, right? So let me go back to the data. Out here, and I kind of just 
rush past, it just gave you the sense of the thing. But what you really have is for any given geometry, so say I have a geometry of G3, okay, and I have a material that happens to be M1. So it's this, uh, actually let's pick G1. So it's this geometry, and let's say it's this material, okay. So I know that G1, M1 sits somewhere, is G1, M1 is here, 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 and here. It's all, uh, it's all that, that point represents G1, M1 in different warps. And what I can do is look at the different warps and figure out which warp is acceptable. And actually, it is monotonic. So some materials, you know, so there is a clear distinction here. This classifier basically tells you that warp one, you can do an awful lot because it's really not a big transformation. Warp phi, you can really only apply for very complex geometry. So the, the more is less part is that for more complex geometries, you can actually get away with doing more crazy stuff to the lighting because we're not very good at disambiguating the lighting from the shape and the, and the material property, okay? So using this classifier, based on the material and geometry, I can pick the level of warp I can support and then use that in my wavelet compression to shuffle around my lighting to a certain extent, to a maximum distance so that I would preserve only maybe warp four distance. Um, and that's sort of the algorithm that we used in that context. But that's a very good question. How do you actually use it? Any other questions? OK. So we have this predictor, and uh, right, and then we can apply it for better compression. That's one example. The other example is that I'd like to talk about how you would apply it in the context of scalable rendering. So I, I'm, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and now talk about the rendering algorithms and sort of the computer science. So that's the perception side, and I've been working with a perception psychologist on doing that side, Jim Faverda. The question is, how do you use all of these perceptual insights that more complexity is something that you can actually uh, do more approximations in? How do you actually plug that into rendering algorithms? So I'll talk about the work I've done with uh, Adam Arbery and Bruce Walter and, and a few other colleagues at uh, Cornell. So again, let me remind you that what is the motivation of, the, of this work? We want to do these interactive visualizations or uh, interactive rendering of scenes so that you're sitting at home and you can design your kitchen. And this is uh, part of the Autodesk showroom project. And you can pick uh, the materials for the surfaces. Uh, the, you, know, you can pick your countertops, your appliances, and it'll look like the real thing, OK? So first, let me give you uh, uh, the problem formulation and talk about the specific way that we solve it in, in our approach. And it's a scalable rendering algorithm. So this is, by the way, a different model. This is a model of Grand Central Station, which is a beautiful space. And after we started modeling it, we learned to appreciate it more. So you're trying to figure out, at a point P, what's the light coming towards your eye? And what is the problem you're trying to solve? Light is coming from these light sources. So let's refer to that as L. I won't give you all the parameters. And you're integrating over all possible light sources in a scene. Okay, That's one problem. Now, this is assuming light's coming directly from the light to the point P. Actually, light doesn't do that. It bounces around, as we talked about. That's the whole indirect illumination problem. How do you handle that? Well, really, what you're integrating uh, over is over all possible lights or the whole hemisphere of light coming in. And you can convert the whole hemisphere into different lights that are lighting this particular point P. Is that clear? OK, so that's the problem I'm trying to solve, this integral. Turns out that's, that's only one part of the problem I'm trying to solve. The integral is a little more complex. What I really want to figure out is a light coming to my eye through a whole area of a pixel. Okay, So I want to integrate all the energy coming through the area, not through one point on that area. So there's an integral of the pixel area. That's one thing that I'd like to support. The, the term for that is anti-aliasing. You anti-alias your images. I want to support volumetric phenomenon. I want to support fog and other media, like water, subsurface scattering. So how would you think of that? What you're really talking about is uh, an integral over the volume from your eye through uh, the entire medium till you hit a surface, and then from that to all the light sources. So I've, I've totally abused the notation, by the way, here, and just put these integrals. I haven't told you over what domains. There's lots of papers on that. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give you a flavor of what the problem is that I'm trying to solve. There's an integral over a volume. There's an integral over all the light sources. There's an integral of the area of the pixel. Okay. There's another thing I'd like to add is something called motion blur. Why? What is motion blur? Uh, you take a camera. You take a photograph. Everybody's moving. It's blurred. Okay. 
that's motion blur. People are moving. The camera is open for a finite aperture for a finite time. And it integrates over that time period. And so when everybody's moving, it looks bad. And this normally annoys us. So why am I interested in computing this? I'm interested in computing it because in graphics, if you don't have motion blur in your, in your videos or in your animations, they look very fake. They look very choppy, and they don't look real. And so this is something that anybody who's producing animations motion blurs their animations before they can produce their final video. What is motion blur? It's an integral over the time period for which the aperture is open. Okay. So you toss that into your integral as well. And oh, here's sort of a, um, a depiction of motion blur on, the, on your left is the original static image. And on the right is this roulette wheel that's spinning around very fast. And you can see that all the numbers on the roulette wheel are, are um, blurred out. But what's interesting is it's actually a rotationally symmetric spindle. So this part is not blurred out. And so that's one of the hard problems with motion blur is you have to correctly integrate that signal so that you can figure out when it stays sharp and when it doesn't stay sharp. And any cheap hack you do based on motion vectors and stuff doesn't typically work out for, for hard cases like this. OK. So that's the problem. I want to solve this complex multidimensional integral. And using sort of the philosophy of you know more is less, what I'm going to take as a holistic approach to solving this problem. OK? Um, I'm going to first go back to my uh, simpler, just the integral over the lights, because I won't have time to talk about how we generalize to the full integral. But suffice it to say that actually, you can look at the problem, that whole integral problem, in a unified manner. And what you can do is basically take all the integrals and then convert that into a summation over all light sources at a point P. Okay. So what you do is you have this point P, and you had light bouncing around, taking all kinds of paths to that point P. You convert that whole integral into a bunch of lights. And I'll show you what lights they are. So in this scene here, in this kitchen scene here, I have a bunch of lights. Some are the lights in the light fixtures, shown in red there. There are some points there. I don't know if you can see them up here. Okay, Those are the lights that are directly lighting any given point. Then there's light that bounced around. And it creates these fake lights, shown in blue here, that you can act like they're real lights. And you can use them in your summation for the energy that's arriving at a point P. And then, in fact, there are lights coming from the sun and the sky, which are outside the room Okay, in green. And so you've taken this whole multidimensional integral and just converted, just converted it into a summation over all lights. Why did I say just in scare quotes? Uh, because there are, you need millions of such lights to get good quality. And then that's an awful lot of summations. You need to, it's not just that you're summing 100 numbers. It's that for each one, you're tracing a ray from that point to that object, figuring out whether those two can be hooked up with each other or not. And that is where all the cost of, of rendering algorithms goes. Um, a big bulk of the cost goes, is figuring out whether you can hook up that light with this point, or is there something in the middle that's going to block it so that you cannot evaluate it. OK? Is it clear what that problem formulation is? is it, OK, great. So as I said, all we're doing is doing the summation over millions of lights. But people have not traditionally approached the problem this way because it's a summation over millions of lights. And there's an awful lot of rays you need to evaluate per point or per pixel in your image. So our approach was to develop a multi-resolution algorithm that would take uh, such a scene, convert it into this unified representation, and then couple that with our perceptual primitives uh, to achieve scalability. And so here, I mean, uh, let me remind you again, scalability is with respect to the lighting. So the scene is very, very complex in lighting, millions of lights. And what we're going to do is scale to that so that we don't have a millions of lights. We're not linear in the cost of all the lights. We're much, much uh, more eff efficient, like sublinear by a bit. Very, very inaccurate term, but you get the idea, right? OK, so how do we do this? So the first thing is, let's take our scene with lots of little lights. These are the individual lights. And here's a very simple example to, show, to illustrate the algorithm. You have four lights lighting the scene, and that's the scene you would get. And here are the lights on the, on the right. OK? Here are the individual lights. The first idea is, do you really see four lights worth of light at any given point? Are we really good at judging that? It turns out not very much. We can group the lights together and cluster them. And then we can use that clustering as an approximation. Now we need to do the clustering intelligently, all of this stuff. It's not a trivial process. But if we can cluster the lights and pick them selectively and intelligently, then we can get a much better approximation without having to evaluate every single light. Okay? So first we compute light clusters. 
For, and in this case, we take those two lights uh, and then we group them together. And then, because it's us, you know, we want to really scale to very high complexity, millions of lights, not scenes with four lights, we actually construct a hierarchical representation over those clusters. Okay? So we construct a light tree. And what it, it is is that these are the leaves of the tree. Uh, and this is out of the classic computer science data structure. These are the leaves of a tree where each of them represents one light. And any node inside the tree represents all the lights below it. So it represents a whole bunch of lights, a cluster of lights under it in the tree. Is that kind of clear? OK, good. And so now we have this light tree representation. And now our goal is to try to find a cut uh, in this data structure to figure out an approximation for the original lighting. So in this case, I picked this particular cut, which is I took these two lights, and I decided not to use these two lights, but use some cluster to represent that light. Okay, And is that OK? Well, this particular cut is this orange cut here. And what I've shown in this image here now is which pixels is it OK for? It turns out for all of these pixels, if I group light three and four together into a larger light, a super light, if you will, in the location of, pic of light four, then all of those orange pixels still look fine. The gray pixels don't, and so we shouldn't use this algorithm for the gray pixels. But for the orange pixels, I've now figured out how to render them with only three lights instead of four lights. This is only a 25% reduction in, in cost, but this was an illustrative example. Reality, we have a million lights, and we try to get away million, five million, 25 million lights, and we try to get, to get away with a few hundred, or at most, a thousand lights instead. Okay, So that's a high-level idea of how this light cuts algorithm works. So for each point, and, and what does perception have to do with this? Well, the question is, how do you pick that cut? I told you that if you pick a cut, it's good, but who's going to tell you what's a good cut? So that's where we couple with perception, uh, perceptually based algorithms. And we say, you start off at the tree, uh, at the root of the tree. And that's your original cut. It says, I'm taking all the lighting and representing it by a single light. That's a terrible approximation. You're not going to do that. But you start that way. And what you do is you test if that's an acceptable, uh, I'm going to tell you the algorithm that basically we're going to keep repeating. You estimate the contribution of that cluster. And here's the hard part. You bound the error it's going to introduce. And this is one of our contributions, is you have to reason about the error you're introducing in your approximation. And then if that error is greater than your perceptual metric, and this is where the perceptual metric comes in, then you say, ah, that's not a good uh, approximation. I'm going to go refine my approximation and make it more expensive but higher quality. And so you go further down in the tree. And you keep doing this till you arrive at a cut where the perceptual metric says, ah, this is good. If just produced an image that basically is as good as the real thing, you can stop here. It's not got the same energy values, but it's got energy values that will fool the human eye when it's looking at the image, and that's what you want. That's the perceptually based rendering algorithm. Okay? And the metrics, we've, we've played with different ones. We've used something called Weber's law. I, I won't get into that now. Uh, and the visual equivalence metric that I talked about earlier. and. Once you do that, let me show you the kinds of results you get. Um, that's that same scene that I, I, I had shown you earlier. This is the kitchen. And oh, you really can't see the axes. OK. Well, all right. So the axes have gotten washed out. Uh, so this is an exciting graph. There are lots of lines, but you don't know what to make of it. Uh, this is uh, on the y-axis is time. And you know, therefore, low is good. And on the x-axis is the complexity, the number of lights. Okay, And so as the number of lights increases, a traditional algorithm is right there on the x equals y line. More lights, more time. Right, That's the blue line. And in fact, the best competing algorithm, unfortunately, doesn't do much better. Whereas our algorithm, because it's able to exploit the fact that you can't see those differences, and it does this clustering uh, while reasoning about its error, it really is down here. It really hugs the bottom down here. And that's good. That means that you're really scaling well with complexity. And the thing to note is, yes, it's much better than the blue line. And as I add more and more lights, it doesn't go you know, suddenly just flip up to the top. It actually kind of tapers out, saying, I can't see more detail just because you're adding more light, so I'm not going to compute more. And that's sort of getting to that scalability that I was talking to you about earlier. You want something that slows down a little bit, but actually recognizes that there's not much more else happening because of our visual system. OK? Is that clear? OK. All right, so these are a few more scenes. Uh, I might, I'll just quickly show you maybe with grants. Uh, 
These are few more scenes were rendered. There's a lot more light in that scene than is visible through this projector. So you should come. Anybody who's interested in seeing the images, please come uh, later and look at them here. But uh, I guess the main thing I'd point, like to point out, the amount of work we're doing is 0.003% of the brute force technique because we're able to do this. And in this case, that's the best result. This is 0.03%. Still very, very good. Okay, And so orders of magnitude better than, than a brute force technique. So that's one way of reasoning about scalability. There's another way of talking about scalability, which is how much more bang, you know, uh, bang for the buck can I get? So say I start off with a scene that has only direct lighting, light coming directly from the light sources at a surface. And you can see it's pretty dark. If I wanted to add indirect illumination, that whole problem of light bouncing around and reaching some steady state, unfortunately, on this projector, I don't know if you can see as much of a difference. This is completely black, and there is more light here. If you look at the images, there's quite a bit more light here. That's the indirect illumination. We're able to compute it at a very small incremental cost. Um, this is fog, and that I think you can see. This is the light. There's some participating media here. And you can see that um, you know, this is typically very expensive to compute. And we can add it to only an 80% increment in cost. I mean, normally, each one of these would slow you down by you know, factors of 10, often, depending on, on the scene and the algorithm. And finally, when you add motion blur, you can, add, you, know, you can get the whole thing for a cost of two. And these are very complex effects just because you're able to leverage off uh, each other. OK, so I think right on time, for the most part. Uh, I'm going to conclude now. There's a great need in graphics, I would say, for very high, uh, supporting very high complexity. And the kind of work I think that needs to get done, and we're starting to scratch the surface. The kind of work we've done doesn't solve the problem. It takes some first steps there, is trying to understand how to couple knowledge of human perception, the limitations of human perception sometimes, and sometimes our ability to see things that we have to get right, because otherwise it'll look bad. How can we exploit that knowledge with graphics algorithms? And the reason this is hard is often the perception psychologists don't quite speak the language of the graphics people and vice versa. So these are sort of two areas. And there's been a body of work that has been coming along for the past 10 years in the community, but we're ramping up more. There's still a lot of work to do there. One of the challenges here is that we need better understanding of, of human perception in the first place. And it's, so that work hasn't yet been, you know, there are a lot of great people doing fun stuff there, but it hasn't quite, it's not like we understand it completely. And we need predictive algorithms that can actually reason about themselves too, another side that has actually not received as much error, uh, attention. So that's sort of the, the broad sort of area and vision that I think is very exciting right now in this, in this uh, field of rendering. Where do I see us going? What do I see as the big challenge in the future in this field? So I'm a science fiction person. And uh, you know the holodeck, right? That's what we always thought we would be at now. And we are not even close to being there. And that would be great. If, we could, if I could live in a world where, where you know, we have that kind of technology at our fingertips, that would be wonderful. Fern was asking me earlier, you know, and would that, would that be a good thing or a bad thing? And I said, you know, that's up to us. The technology has to be there, and we should use it for good things. But that's up to us. So that's what I think would be exciting in the future. All right, thank you for your attention. And you can follow up. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yes. So we don't compute the full reference. What we do is we keep a running count of energy. And what happens is if your energy becomes large enough, right, you, you throw out. Right. So we do not compute the reference. And because, yeah, that whole chicken and egg problem between the reference has been one of the reasons this has been an area that hasn't, you know, till recently been progressed enough because of the chicken and egg problem, which we think we've now started to get a handle on. Still, there's more to do there. Yes. A uh, question in the back, and then I'll come to you. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Very good. You have to know what the scene is, but it's part of your input specification. So what happens is you get your geometry, you get your materials, and you get 
in this room, I'll get the specification of all those lights, which ones are on and off, and the spotlights. Okay? Then what I do is I spray a bunch of particles. It's called photon tracing in my field. Spray a bunch of particles into the scene. And wherever those particles hit surfaces, I deposit energy and make that a new light. Okay? Those are my secondary lights. These are my primary lights. And I couple them together into my integral. So, so you still need to know what primary lights are. You have to, right. Right. So one question is, uh, I think one, one question that you might be asking, which I can answer is, can we predict, without even the light sources, can we predict, given this object, I can do so much, right? I can throw away so much energy. I can compute so much energy, approximately. Uh, you can come up with some sort of these thresholds, they're called. So you can say, well, for this guy, you can be 1.5x wrong. And for that guy, uh, that guy, because his shape is different, you can be 2x wrong. So you can come up with thresholds. But the bottom line is you do need the final energy input to figure out the final light color that's going up. But the thresholds is one approach that people have explored. Yes? Uh, no, it's a, you got to, the projector is just killing me here. Sorry, uh, you got to come here and look at the images. They're way better than this. Sorry, it's just I, I can't help it. It is what it is. But uh, and you can uh, and you can go and read my papers. Of course not. But I can. I'm not sure how to solve the problem. But you know the the figures are on my web page, for example. And you can see the colors there more clearly. Um, there is a there's a deeper question. Has the graphics algorithm computed something that looks like the real thing. Uh, the, the, you know, the jury's out on that, right? For simpler scenes, for very simple scenes and lighting, you can come up with things that look, and people are confused. They're not sure if it's a photograph or the real thing. But when you get to very high complexity, uh, unless your model is really, really good, uh, in fact, most of the time, people will go, yeah, that's the wrong one. They just know. So we still have a ways to go there. We're not at that holodeck experience. But the colors are, are not quite the issue. So you should come and see, look at the images here. Yeah. Good. And yes. Uh, well, that's a good question. And if I can find my slide. Yeah, let's try this guy. Maybe, yeah. So these are the numbers for that scene. And I didn't, and in fact, now that I have you here, let's see if I can compute a video. Yes, it's working. OK. So that's what the motion blur scene It's about. So this was 590 seconds, and I didn't mess with it because these are original images uh, numbers. But that was on a, a dual core uh, processor that was not terribly fast. So on today's machines, it would be about half of that in time on a, on a single box. A quad core, or half or a quarter of that is what we're talking about. So that's just under 10 minutes, about three minutes, let's call it. Um, and that's about the time it takes for that. And here is uh, this guy is a little more, about about three, three to four minutes. And let's see, is it going to work? That's the kitchen with fog in it. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. OK. If it comes up, but uh, yeah, so that's sort of showing the light sweeping across the, uh, the kitchen. These are per frame. And so for the animation, you compute 30 frames a second. That times the number of seconds. That's what you do. I have done some work on sort of exploiting information from frame to frame because of temporal coherence. Uh, you know, things don't change that much from frame to frame. Uh, we've looked at that problem too, but this is sort of every image is clean and it's pretty fast. Sorry? This is with light transport, you said? This is with light cuts. Yeah, this is all with light cuts. We've done some previewing work. It doesn't quite have the guaranteed error bound, but we've done some previewing work. That's actually the work that uh, collaborated uh, one of the projects with Fabio. We have multiple in that area. And that can actually do it in seconds, 10 seconds for preview. Uh, that's not so bad, but the quality isn't as pixel perfect as, as light cuts would aim for. So we have sort of different points in the performance quality trade off. Thank you.